Um, and thank you very much, Richard, for that wonderful introduction. I'm going to actually move the camera back a little bit to begin uh, and speak a little before talking about human rights per se or the chances of litigating um, the human rights uh, consequences of climate change in international courts. And I should underline that, that I'll be speaking about international fora. Um, I'm going to begin by looking at the larger justice issues which I think lead us into thinking about this as primarily or partially a human rights um, issue. Um, I started working on the human rights dimensions of climate change uh, in 2007, and curiously there was almost no work at all being done on the issue uh, at that time. Um, fortunately, things have changed uh, quite dramatically now. Um, so first I'll give some framing of the justice claims that are made with regard to climate change and how they relate to human rights. Then I'll say something about the promise of human rights. I'll go back to the original text just to remind us of, of, of what that promise is. Uh, how that promise is in any case uh, unfulfilled before climate change comes along and makes it look increasingly unfulfillable, you might say. And then I'll turn to the uh, question of litigation and the sorts of obstacles um, that are likely to present themselves if one wished to make use of international fora um, to address the human rights uh, harms associated with climate change. Finally, if I don't run out of time, but I suspect I will, I may say a few words about uh, state responsibility. I had promised that I'd talk about other uh, fora uh, than simply the human rights ones uh, that would take us to the ICJ and ideally to the WTO, but I'm not going to make it to the WCO. So, um, Broadly speaking, and again, just to step back and give a sort of a, a broad contextual claim from a sort of a political philosophy perspective, perhaps, there are four or perhaps five differentiable justice claims that are made about, human, about climate change, about the problems it poses. Um, the first is very simple. Climate change causes harm. Activities done in one part of the world cause harm in another part of the world. It's, it's, it's the kind of problem we think of as a tort problem. Or we might call it a corrective justice problem. And the uh, answer is fairly straightforward. You desist from the harmful activities, and you compensate those harms. Um, but there's a second kind of a justice problem associated with climate change, and that is what you might call development freeze. Because some countries have effectively used up the Earth's carbon dump, as some people call it, the atmospheric capacity to develop, other countries aren't going to be able to do that. That was a major concern at the original Rio conference. Um, you might call that a substantive justice claim. No, obviously illegal thing has taken place, and yet there has been a harm caused uh, in, in terms of um, uh, the development of the uh, developing countries. Um, the answer to that would appear to be some form of contribution towards their development in order to overcome the possibility of a freeze uh, or a lock-in of differential development in different parts of the world. Um, the third claim you might call procedural, a procedural justice claim. That is the claim to be represented in the negotiation of a uh, framework with which to address climate change. Uh, the obvious answer to that is some form of participation for all those affected in decision making. Uh, and, and now we're reaching towards more um, typical human rights type claims. Uh, and the fourth is a claim that we might refer to as a formal justice claim. Some people have existing entitlements to the way in which they have been using the carbon dump. Um, and they will hold out those entitlements as acquired rights. Um, and this is a, a justice claim that's not often, I think, articulated as such, but actually is quite central yeah. insofar as this is, is perhaps the major drag on making progress in climate change. Um, a fifth claim, which doesn't arise, interestingly, at all any longer, would be a retributive justice claim, that in some way causing egregious damage to the climate or to the environment might have been thought of as a crime. And in fact, in some countries it is thought of as a crime, um, but that hasn't had much um, um, traction at international level. Um, okay, I, the, 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 the obvious kind of justice I haven't mentioned here is, is what we would refer to as distributive justice, and the, I think, fairly obvious reason for that is each of these claims entails a distributive justice aspect to it. Uh, so, moving forward slightly, Within the UNFCCC regime as it currently exists, each of these different types of claims, with the exception of the retributive claim, um, is addressed, actually. Uh, the claim to stop harms and provide compensation is presumably what's going on with, with regard to mitigation and adaptation policy. 
we mitigate um, greenhouse gases, limit them, and thereby um, stop the harm in principle. Or if we fail to do so, as Richard points out, we turn to some form of uh, compensation through international adaptation transfers. Um, the substantive justice claim that development has been frozen or risks being frozen was to be addressed through something called technology transfer in other countries. It's a part of the Rio framework, which is there in 1992, but which hasn't received much attention in the intervening 20 years. Not that any other part of it particularly has, but technology transfer in particular is, seems to be on the way out. Um, the procedural justice claim, of course, is, is addressed through the series of COPs that we see, we see year after year in attempting to move the process forward. It may be seen as, in fact, more of an obstacle than a, than a progressive um, uh, factor. Uh, and the formal justice claims are represented, I think, in the voice of those who are currently using um, carbon uh, in um, framing the regime in ways that seem to work best for them, market solutions in particular, emissions trading and red. Um, that's what happened, you might say, to these claims over the 20 odd years since uh, the first Rio um, meeting. Um, so, again, broad brush. Um, what did human rights promise? Um, and it's just worth recalling briefly the human rights framework that we have today comes in right at the end of the Second World War, a period during which it seemed apparent that uh, extraordinary feats of policy were possible. That's, of course, how the war was won. And a new world order was established, and that new world order is, is, is idealistic and hopeful in a way that seems um, quaint, I think, sometimes today. Um, the Universal Declaration makes broad claims about a social and international order in which uh, everybody will attain to the right set forward in the Declaration itself. Um, the Universal Declaration, as many of you will know, is not itself a binding international law document. It's subsequently negotiated into two um, documents, an International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, ICCPR, um, championed by what were now the Western states of the Cold War era, um, which establishes basic um, civil and political rights. Uh, and these include, and the ones I've put up here, are um, relevant, I think, to the problem of climate change in an obvious way, um, the right to self-determination, um, the, uh, the idea that people may uh, freely dispose of their natural wealth for their own ends, and that in no case may people be deprived of its own means of subsistence, um, and Article 6 on the right to life. Um, the second covenant is the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. For those of you dealing with international law all the time, this will be very straightforward, so I apologize for that. Um, and that includes rights to health, food, water, most recently. Water has been read into the right to health under Article, uh, right to food, excuse me, under Article 11. Um, and under Article 13, the right of everyone to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress and its applications. Um, extremely broad claims, extremely idealistic. Um, the right to the continuous improvement of living conditions for all people. Uh, the right to the highest attainable standards of physical and mental health. Um, the situation. Just, oh, have a, right. The situation today, 60 years on, unfortunately, is that these rights are, in any case, not really being fulfilled, so to speak. Uh, and the figures seem to increase year on year. We had 800,000 people suffering from hunger in uh, as recently as 2004, um, with the figures today is usually given as being a billion. Um, likewise, a billion people live in slums, uh, and so forth. A series of statistics I'm sure you're uh, quite familiar with. Um, this is before uh, climate change um, comes along and makes things considerably worse. Uh, the predictions, and these are taken from the IPCC's uh, fourth uh, report, which came out in 2007, um, are an increase of 50 million people uh, at risk of hunger by 2020, 132 million by 2050, 266 million by 2080, uh, an increase um, uh, in the uh, water stress um, in Asia uh, affecting 120 million to 1.2 billion people, um, 
seven to 77 million people in, in Latin America, uh, and increases in malaria and dengue and other um, um, diseases. Um, now, these were all relatively modest predictions, and of course, as those of you who have been following the climate science will know, things have been changing faster and more forcefully than initially predicted. So the next uh, IPCC report is due in 2014, and we're expecting to see considerably um, worse uh, predictions uh, than these. Um, okay, so that's the broad context. A series of human rights that are in any case apparently getting worse, and these are to be exacerbated, it seems, through climate change. Um, to what extent does the international human rights framework help? Uh, I'm going to suggest that it is not out of the question that it may help, but it faces quite significant obstacles, or those of us who may wish to lever it will find ourselves facing quite significant obstacles in doing so. <coughs> and I'm going to speak about three in particular. Um, the question of predictability, the question of enforceability, and the question of extraterritoriality. Um, I suppose from the, initially I should point out there are other ways in which you might think, of, as Richard was saying, other ways you might think about this problem other than litigation. And of course the real work is going on in Geneva right now to try and bring the two regimes, the climate change regime and the human rights regime, closer together. And by reading climate change text into uh, human rights council resolutions uh, and also by placing human rights language into the ongoing and negotiating text for climate change. And there's been a certain amount of success in that area. Um, most notably in uh, Cancun. Um, the other thing I should say is that when uh, I, I said a moment ago in 2007, nobody was doing any work in this, and that's not strictly true. There had been at that time one case that had made the headlines, um, which was uh, the, the Inuit case, which you were very familiar with, in which a group of Inuit um, had asked the Inter American Commission on Human Rights. Um, to look at the degree to which their human rights were in the process of being violated by Canada and the US for failing to have reined in their um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, that case is curious to look at from the, a legal perspective because they're working with a non-binding text and they're addressing a quasi-judicial forum. Um, and there's all sorts of reasons why one wouldn't expect it to have succeeded. Uh, and the commission, rather than actually passing any sort of remarks on it, simply held a public hearing to have the issue aired without actually um, uh, reaching any conclusion. Um, so really it was a, a publicity exercise, and from that point of view I think it was quite successful actually. Um, okay. So predictability. I said a moment ago, um, I, I gave a series of um, broad statistics uh, called from the IPCC's uh, last report. And I guess from the point of view of climate change litigation, the first thing to notice is these are not really figures that look like uh, substantive human rights um, violations. Uh, seven to 77 million people, uh, we're talking about a factor of 10. They're clearly working with very broad breast statistics uh, and are not in a position to um, predict with any precision what exactly is going to take place, where exactly it is going to take place, and who exactly is going to be hit. Your problem of backward looking forward. Uh, how, how to address uh, harms in the, in, in the future. Um, I suggest, though, that this is not necessarily um, fatal to uh, thinking about uh, possible human rights litigation. The case um, I would refer to for this is, uh, was a case in front of the uh, European Court of Human Rights called uh, Unair Yildiz versus Turkey. Uh, it was a case that involved um, 39 persons who... Um, died in a methane explosion. They were living in slums at the near rubbish tip. And the various other persons uh, in near Istanbul were simply loading up more and more rubbish into this tip uh, until at one point um, it eventually exploded and killed 39 persons. The case was brought under two of the substantive rights in the, in the uh, European Convention on Human Rights, the right to life and the right to property. Um, the court ruled against Turkey on the basis that a um, report had been produced two years previous to the actual explosion in which um, the city council had noted the likelihood that the rubbish tip might in fact explode. Uh, I'll give a brief excerpt from that report here. Um, so the uh, view of the court was that the state officials and authorities did not do everything within their power to protect the victims 
from the immediate and known risks to which they were exposed. Um, they were known insofar as they had been reported upon, and they were immediate. I suppose something that happens two years later doesn't appear immediate, except insofar as it could have happened at any time. Um, now, I would assume that in this, uh, in this conclusion, it's not actually relevant whether there were 39 victims or 139 victims or 9 victims. Uh, the, 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 the fact of 10 is the, the precise persons involved is not the point here. The point was there's knowledge in advance, and the state doesn't act on that knowledge. Um, that would seem, I think, to fit the general facts that relate to climate change, at least broadly. Um, the next issue uh, is uh, enforceability. Um, as you are no doubt aware, few of the international human rights treaties are well enforced. Um, even the ICCPR has a quite weak um, enforcement mechanism known as the Human Rights Committee, uh, which reviews reports from states and occasionally reviews petitions. Um, by far the strongest court is the European Court of Human Rights. I'm just using my examples here, but of course that only applies um, to European states and members of the Council of Europe. There's 50 of them. Um, and the ICE SAR, the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which I suggest is the document in which we find the rights that are most obviously affected by climate change, doesn't really have any teeth at all. It has a committee. Uh, which again receives reports from states and issues uh, its conclusions on those reports. Uh, and in addition, you have a series of special procedures at the UN. Uh, those are generally special rapporteurs who have a mandate to go and uh, uh, look at the degree to which specific rights are being protected in specific places or more broadly. Um, the current uh, special, special rapporteur on the right to food in particular, uh, Olivier de Scooter is his name, has been very, very active in looking at the degree to which climate change impacts the right to food and has written some very sophisticated reports on the degree to which this might be um, addressed. Um, but it is, in fact, happening today um, that the issues relating to climate change are making their way into the mandates of a number of these special procedures, uh, the Special Rapporteur on the Right to Housing, uh, Health, uh, Water, Extreme Poverty, and IDPs are all looking directly at it. And the um, committee itself is also increasingly asking states to report on the degree to which they um, are addressing or monitoring and addressing um, uh, violations of rights attributable in some form to climate change. Uh, and of course, the final form of enforcement is really welfare programs. I was going to say that uh, over the last 20 years, these have been taking quite a hit in much of the world. But I just heard the news on the way here today, and I was very pleased to hear that the Supreme Court in the United States has ruled in favor of the Constitution. Obviously, you heard this, no doubt. Of, uh, of Obamacare, so maybe the tide is changing. Um, in any case, none of these are necessarily justiciable rights, and it can be um, difficult even to find fora in which they will be uh, recognized as, as justiciable. Um, however, what I would suggest is there are times where it is often possible, I think, to reframe effective violations of economic, social, and cultural rights in terms of more enforceable and more justiciable civil and political rights. Um, this may be because, in part, what's happening through climate change is an, is an effective diminishment of an existing right. It becomes, uh, 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 the right worsens uh, as opposed to the ordinary, it becomes a negative obligation for lack of government to ensure that it doesn't get any worse, as opposed to being a positive obligation to fulfill something which isn't already there. Um, a good example that has made it to the courts, I think, is the, is, is, is the example of Lopez uh, Austria versus Spain, also in the European Court of Human Rights. Um, this involved the building of a tannery on municipal land in, in Murcia, um, which emitted uh, hydrogen sulfide fumes, leading to uh, health problems for some of the local inhabitants, uh, and the applicant's daughter being one of them, Lopez uh, Austria. In fact, Spain is a country which does have a constitutional right to a clean and healthy environment and actually makes it a crime um, to damage the environment beyond a certain point. And in this case, interestingly, in the background to it, uh, a prosecutor opened an investigation into the uh, tannery. It didn't, uh, uh, on the basis of a crime against the environment. Um, that didn't actually go anywhere, though. Um, so again, we have reports um, demonstrating the fact that the emissions are uh, beyond um, permitted levels uh, of uh, pollutants and, uh, and effluents. Um, and the court ultimately finds that there has been a violation of um, Lopez Ostra's rights uh, under, I'm just going to pop forward a sec, uh, under Article 8, the, uh, which is the right to privacy, home, and family life. That, in other words, she couldn't enjoy her privacy or her family life fully 
because of the existence of this tunnel we built nearby. Um, now, a number of points to make about this. So, so, so effectively, a, a right to health issue is effectively reframed as a right to home and family life issue and becomes available for uh, litigation in, in, in the European court. Um, so apart from the fact that um, this, the, the right to home, privacy, and family life is unusual to the European Convention. It's not actually typical to human life. You don't find it in the Convention. Um, it's also worth pointing out the Sakursa, the tannery in question there, um, uh, it was built on municipal land, and it was the fact that the state owned the land in question that made um, it justiciable in front of the court. Had it been private property, it's not clear that in fact it would have been the case. Um, this obviously matters if we're trying to draw connections with climate change, because very often, the, uh, as you point out, it's in, in private hands. It also, of course, in the background, provides an incentive to government to ensure these things are in fact taking place privately rather than publicly. Um, to uh, avoid liability for them. Uh, and that points to, I think, a more general problem with hu the human rights, international human rights framework as it currently functions, which is that it's not terribly good at taking on private harms. Um, uh, a second point uh, to make is a very classic piece of European court ruling on this uh, in, in finding the violation. They found it in terms of the uh, obligation on the state to strike a fair balance between what they call the town's economic well-being of having a waste treatment plant uh, and the applicant's uh, effective enjoyment of her rights. You have, a, you have a right of an individual and you have a, uh, a, an economic benefit of a town and you weigh them up one against the other and if it turns out that this has been violated more than this has been, um, uh, you, you, you know how this uh, balancing works. Now when we come to climate change, of course, this is potentially a very serious issue because the economic benefits from climate change are enormous. So how are we going to go about balancing human rights violations against those um, economic benefits. Um, good. The uh, third issue, and I would suggest that this um, this is a little more fatal, actually, than the previous two, um, concerns extraterritoriality, and, and, and Richard touched on this. But it's all well and good if, if, if uh, Spain doesn't rein in its climate change or the UK doesn't rein in its climate change emissions and, and houses begin to fall off the cliff in Dover uh, and, and there's a case in the United States for not having acted. It's quite another thing if those houses are not in Dover but are in um, Portugal and another thing again if they're in um, uh, on the edge of, say, Senegal where I live for a little while myself. Um, the uh, available forum simply uh, vanishes effectively. Uh, and so the question becomes one of to what extent can a state be held responsible for actions taken within its jurisdiction that have effects in, in, in other jurisdictions, a problem that you are very familiar with, I'm sure, uh, of extraterritoriality. Um, and here, um, those of you who've been paying attention to the uh, uh, various cases that have come out of um, the Iraq war in particular, but also there's a whole um, thread of these cases within the European court um, system dealing with extraterritoriality. Um, have been making a certain amount of progress insofar as they have, uh, the court has increasingly been willing to find the states, to find that they have jurisdiction over acts of states that have effects in, in other countries. Um, but even so, um, the cases I've named here, Bankovic, Isa, and al are probably the three, most, three key cases in, in, in a, uh, an evolving um, stream. Um, we're still talking about very specific kinds of actions. Uh, they're direct threats to civilian political rights, they're killings uh, in, in, in all cases, actually. And the question has always been whether direct killings, in other words, by a state agent of another person in another country. So to what extent um, does the court have jurisdiction over uh, a, a UK soldier in Iraq kills an Iraqi civilian um, uh, because of his happened outside of the UK? Um, and this, the, the court has gone through what are called state agent authority, two different theories of, effectively of, of attributing responsibility. One is state agent authority, if the person or the, the harm is within the direct authority of a state agent, a public official, so a soldier perhaps. Um, in the case of ISA, uh, if the Turkish soldiers had actually captured these people and brought them into a prison and then executed them, the court would have jurisdiction. And the other is uh, effective control over an area, if you are uh, effectively occupying a territory as was the case in Iraq. In the al Stanley case, um, the court had jurisdiction because uh, the UK had become the effective sovereign over uh, Basra at the time uh, of the shootings. 
Um, now, clearly, that's a long uh, distance from what's happening in climate change. And although it is the case that the actual acts that give rise to the harms in climate change are, ha are happening on the territory, uh, as opposed to themselves happening actually territorially, the harms are clearly not. And uh, it's far from clear to me that there's uh, any way of bridging this quickly or easily. We listen to a lot of being lost. Uh, so we can assume uh, the case you mentioned, the Czech uh, uh, Micronesia case, is certainly the most interesting in this regard, actually. Maybe you might want to say more about that at some point. Um, and the other thing, of course, is the degree to which it would apply to harms which are effectively economic, social, and cultural rights harms. Um, so let's not break out the champagne just yet, I guess. Um, so if, if human rights courts are not sh looking like the obvious fora to bring these kinds of harms to, then what about other international fora? And the obvious one that people think of here is the, is the International um, uh, Court of Justice, the ICJ in The Hague. Um, and there's been a lot of work uh, to try and establish that there are principles upon which one state effectively could sue another, or civil society actors could prod a state into doing this, perhaps, uh, on the basis uh, of either customary international law or international treaty law. Uh, under customary international law, the classic example is the uh, no harm uh, principle, um, which is stated um, in uh, the Trail Smelter case and is then restated in a number of documents, the Rio Principles, the Stockholm Declaration, and finally the uh, Gopji Kovo case in the ICJ in 1997, uh, which recognizes a general obligation on states to ensure that activities within their jurisdiction or control do not cause damage to the environment of other states. So uh, effectively what we've been talking about a moment ago is actually territorial human rights harms would appear to be addressed through uh, interstate um, uh, uh, principles of customary international law. Um, and then uh, one might add to this certain principles laid out in either the, uh, draft, the ILC's draft articles uh, on the responsibility of states for internationally wrongful acts or the ILC's draft articles on transboundary harms and other harmful activities, which lay out in some detail obligations held between states and with regard to transboundary harms. Uh, also worth mentioning, uh, is, to pick up a point you made, is the uh, Aarhus Convention mm -hmm. on the Rights to Information and Access to Justice in Environmental Matters. That's a, a UNEC-based treaty, so there are only European members' uh, uh, signatories of the treaty, but in principle it's open to other countries too, actually. Uh, and lays out quite significant uh, information requirements upon states uh, in dealing with uh, the environment. So it could, could be important. So it hasn't really been. Um, the problem, again, however, is a question of forum. As I'm sure um, you are aware, um, it's, uh, uh, the, the ICJ is not a universal uh, forum. Um, let me address this slide, though. Um, in addition to the breach of customary international law, you might assume there's grounds uh, in breach of treaty. And the obvious treaties here are the UNFCCC and the, and the Kyoto Protocol. Um, and the obvious grounds would appear to be the general um, admonition within the UNFCCC that state signatories take steps um, to prevent, uh, to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations and to, and to prevent um, anthropogenic, dangerous anthropogenic uh, emissions. Um, so there seem to be grants available under both customary and, and uh, treaty law. Um, but, uh, but when it comes to finding a forum, the first thing you'll notice is that the ICJ isn't a natural forum for these things. It has uh, compulsory jurisdiction only over states that have declared that they accept it. Uh, notably, that doesn't include the United States, but actually there's only 76, I think, states that have declared to accept compulsory jurisdiction of the ICJ. Um, when states have spoken about going there, a Tuvalu for a while was considering taking a case. And of course, a state may accept a case in the court on a voluntary basis, on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so Tuvalu looked into the possibility of bringing something involved in the United States to the ICJ and were quickly told that their development funding would be cut substantially and didn't look into it any further. So, so the story goes. <laughs> Under the UFCCC, what are the available uh, fora? Um, once again, and the Kyoto Protocol reflects the same language, uh, states uh, may declare the compulsory jurisdiction of the ICJ in resolving disputes under the UFCCC or the Kyoto Protocol. Um, 
or and or uh, they can declare uh, the compulsory jurisdiction of an arbitration panel to be set up according to procedures to be adopted by the conference of the parties. No states have declared the compulsory jurisdiction of either the ICJ or an arbitration panel, and uh, the UNFCCC does make um, uh, provision for a conciliation commission to be created should it, on an ad hoc basis should there be a uh, dispute that arises. Um, but so far, no states have, have, have sought fit to try and use them. Um, okay, so uh, that's, that's probably a good place to stop. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much.